Hi John, it's Hello. great to speak to you today. Um, looking forward to the discussion about games, games broadly and uh, using digital media, communications and engagement, uh, but also I suppose for us specifically in health and in pharmaceuticals. Uh, I've got a few topics that I really want to get your thoughts on and have a discussion about. Um, but I suppose before we start, I suppose it's worth saying uh, how important games are, uh, both to the people in their everyday life as the forefront of the entertainment industry, it dwarfs Hollywood uh, with regard to the launch of a game and how much money games make. Um, also the way it's driven, even the way we interact with technology, um, everything from interface tools like joysticks, now the Kinect mm. sensor which could revolutionise the way we interact through medicine as well, mm. uh, but also obvious things like you know memory cards, graphics cards, you know, it, it's really driven the development of technology and it's many people's way into technology. So for yourself, I mean, how did you first become interested in games uh, and, you know, was it through, you know, your first experience with a computer yourself? Or? Well, game, games per se, um, obviously, is, you know, it's a fundamental human uh, activity and it has been for since the you know, evolution of, of humankind. You know, you games and games for learning, games for socializing, games for bonding, mm. etc. But digital, um, I think, um, probably the ZX Spectrum. Yeah. Uh, yeah, was was my first computer. So it was um, playing games on that mm. and uh, and also um, yeah, coding as well yeah. back then with the with the with the. With the spectrum. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the same, and it sounds like we're from the same, pretty much the same generation. Yeah. It was amazingly the uh, ZX Spectrum for me, yeah. which isn't as cool as saying Apple II or no, it's even not. the Commodore, but it's just the truth, isn't it? Well, we're just a little bit younger than those people. Yeah, who, we are. Uh, Kenya, who say, who say that? But uh, yeah, I remember spending days just copying out bits of code from magazines. And yeah. It not working, you know. Yeah, well, I remember it not working. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, I learned to code. Basic, which hasn't been massively useful for me since. No. Uh, not very well, it has to be said. <laughs> uh, not very excitingly either, with uh, with you know flashing screens saying warning or uh, <laughs> eventually iterations of games like you say that you uh, you couldn't actually properly check for errors, so it would never work. Yeah. But it, was, it's, it is a lot of people's entry in, into into technology. Yeah, and I, th and I think gaming then was very much kind of like you know it was platform based gaming and. And the evolution of gaming has been fascinating, as you mm. say, right the way through to uh, to now, where where it's almost becoming a, a, a science in itself. Mm. You know, how how do we apply those those gaming uh, principles or gamification principles to um, in a, for a multitude of different outcomes, mm. and whether that's behaviour changing or, um, or or just entertainment. Mm. You know? And 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 you touched on something as well, the connect, con the, con the connect. Yeah. Um, yeah, fundamentally, it could change the way that we um, interact, not just with technology, but with each other yeah, as well. Right. And I was at a conference recently where um, the guy from Microsoft was talking about how every single surface there is could potentially be a screen. Mm. So we're, we're going to be at the, the point soon where um, everything around you is an interface mm. for, for your daily life. Yeah. And, and, and if gamification and gaming principles are applied to some of that as well, it's going to be fascinating world. It will, and it's interesting what you already mentioned straight up about um, about motivational design, about trying to yeah. integrate gaming principles into maybe everyday non-gaming applications. And I mean, it amazed me when I looked back at some of the literature and trying to find the source of talking about game principles for other applications. When you think it was pretty much the mid '70s, uh, 1975, with a guy that I won't pronounce very well, like Mihaly uh, Chick sent me high. Which uh, I'm sure you're very aware of. I of was, course. Yeah. I was before I read it myself. <laughs> but what interested me is exactly what you said, was he talked about human happiness and flow. And it was interesting that what he described as game principles still hold now, yeah. considering having, which is about having a goal, mm -hmm. you know, that you know, people can share, having a, having a mission, I suppose, having a uh, request. Yeah, exactly. Having rules, mm -hmm. obviously without rules, you know, and rules actually spur creativity, which has been proven time and again, which is an interesting point for pharma, which yeah. maybe we can touch on a little bit. Uh, obviously having a feedback system, so I mean, and ov obvious ones are progress bars and points and tables and stuff, but there's lots of complex feedback systems, yeah. which I know you're going you to chat about mm -hmm. yourself. And also an agreement to participate in that and abide by, mm -hmm. by those systems. And actually, this, with the end of the 1970s and the start of commercial video games, and obviously where it is now, um, 
there's, there's that capacity to intersect that level of psych, you know psychology and understanding of what how human beings are made happy and how motivated to do things with video gaming and you know gaming as we see it now. So I mean, is that something you've already kind of briefly talked about? Is it something you want to integrate more into the digital work that you do? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the analogy I always I, I, I've used before um, is game. You know. People often got. I had a conversation recently um, at, at a conference where they said, "Look, healthcare isn't a game. Okay? It's not fun. Mm -hmm. you should apply those." I said, "Well, the difference between games and gamification is very different." And but if you think of it like this, you know, a book. Some books are, are, are very useful. Mm -hmm. Great literature, you know, educational books. And some books are not. Some books mm -hmm. are trashy, throwaway books. Mm -hmm. Games are the same thing. You can have trashy throw games. You can have games which can do good in teaching and education. It's what's in the, the subject matter which is, is important. It's yeah. not the, the principle per se of, of gaming. Yeah. So if we can harness, you know, some of some of the the, the goodness or mm -hmm. some of the um, um, if, if we if we um, the outcome of what we want to achieve, mm -hmm. um, gaming can help us get there, mm -hmm. and whatever it is. So for me. Um, um, at Boehringer, we've used games for a multitude of different outcomes, mm. and, we, and we've used them very much as the kind of vehicle to get there. Mm. So whether that's behaviour changing, or uh, helping to uh, drug discovery, or, or, or entertaining, uh, you know, to learn. Mm. Um, so there are different outcomes there. Yeah, and, uh, and like you mentioned, obviously, just because something's a game doesn't mean it's fun anyway. Yeah. I mean, many of the games I've played really weren't that much fun. Especially the ones that farm out. Well, of course. I disagree that healthcare can't be fun. It depends how you define fun. Fun in different languages means very different things. If it means engagement and some form of feedback and entertainment, then I don't see why everything you do can't be made to at least be engaged. And, and, and solving problems for science and health is about as engaging as it gets in many ways. Absolutely. And if you read Dave de Bronckhart, the equation of Dave's book, you know, which I think is, uh, if I get the right order, eat, sing, Laugh, sing, eat like a pig. Yeah. Uh, the laughter bit was fundamental, and he yeah. was almost prescribed. You know, his doctor said, you know, you need to laugh. You know, yeah. you need to keep a good, you know, um, a mental frame of mind to Com overcome to, to overcome your disease, your illness, your cancer. So, and, uh, yeah. so laughter and fun is, is an important element. I think, part and part of life, but, you know, yeah. that. I mean, we can go on to talk about some of the things about harnessing games for science and things like that later on with some of the great stuff you do. Uh, but just uh, because I love the idea of talking about how things don't work as well. It'd be just really great to pass on to a little bit or pick up on uh, to say that not everything in gaming or gamification is good because I've definitely seen um, you know, words with things like games for health and that for, for many years and like you say you can do things well and you can do things bad. Bad gamification kind of misunderstands uh, the behavioural complexity that people have with games, you know the complex feedback systems, the complex symbiosis with the way people are motivated and behave with obvious um, kind of points and badges and tables which can form part of a meaningful system but can be meaningless. I mean do you have any thoughts about kind of gamification as a new kind of pseudo technology marketing consultancy type term which can as you say mislead people actually and can make it sound more facile than it actually is? Yeah and I know some people get hung up on um, phrases and terms I'm probably you know, guilty of that myself, but you know I don't think there's anything wrong with saying gamification as a as a movement because I think mm. it's it's what you understand from it. And um, but for me, you know, gaming gamification is all the same thing. Gaming was is is a as a, is, a, is you know, historically a childlike kind of um, a fun um, a basic human need mm. and you know we didn't think that was important enough. You know, mm. we, there was sort of you know child childhood kind of infantile uh, associations to it. So we, we created this thing called gamification. You know we made it sound more scientific and mm. more important. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's my, my take on that, but the, the same thing yeah. essentially. Um, but yeah I mean a good game will tap into some kind of human psychology, some kind of you know fundamental uh, motivational and whether you know, and it needs to touch on all those things that you talked about before: mm. um, rules, and mission, mm. and rewards, and, and how they manifest throughout the game is, is you know as unique as, as, mm. as anything. Because 
that's the great thing about creativity, right? Yeah. But and it needs to have other things as well, like surprises. Mm. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's the same reason why you know people get addicted to checking their emails on, on, a, on a device. Mm. You know, every time you open it up, is there going to be an email there or not? And that's that's a that's a type of psychological game that you play with yourself almost. Mm. So um, we need those sort of um, those feedback loops in the game as well. Um, but different games are different, right? Mm. So um, some can be very simple, some can be hugely complex. Mm. I kind of predicted in one of the things I wrote at Full Farmer Forum actually about how mm -hmm. I thought games would enter the mainstream, whatever the mainstream is. And I think that they definitely have this year, in the mm. sense that it's not now unusual to talk about games in the context of pharmaceutical companies, yeah. in the context of health, and people not laugh you out of the room, uh, which you know, <laughs> I'm scarred from having happened to me a few times, you know, a few years ago. Sure. And you know, what amazes me is that when you talk about you know, the vast number of very dull, very badly executed uh, websites or other applications that are done by a lot of businesses, not just pharma, but, you know, a lot of businesses. When you think of the capacity to actually affect someone's clinical outcomes, we, you know, games have proven themselves already in, that, in the sense that they, whether we're talking about motivational design and things like cognitive behavioural therapy, yeah, emotional support and nutrition, um, you know, mental health and well-being and a whole host of other things that I can't remember. Uh, or to actual games on devices uh, that in help people improve uh, motor symptoms with Parkinson's, recover mm -hmm. from stroke, or a study which showed clinical improvement in people with mild depression in the elderly. Well, the big the big one that was often quoted was was it uh, remission the uh, the one for um, for kids mm -hmm. to explain I think it was the oncology yeah and yeah oncology to to you know, encourage. Um, you know, learning for why they need to, why they, why they're having the treatment they're having, and why they need to be more adher adherent to their, to their um, medication. Yeah. That and was yeah, a big yeah. study. It is, and actually, there's a lot of work in in adherence, yeah. looking at that. I think it, it's fascinating. So far from being something that I think uh, anybody needs to be remotely uh, embarrassed about trying to push forward or feel it's like on, on it's on the periphery or ludicrous. I mean, I'd suggest before we move on to things you know, like virtual worlds and some of the great stuff that you're doing in social gaming and even kind of harnessing games for science themselves, when you think of the innovation businesses that pharmaceutical companies are in regard to discovery and all the rest of it. Um, I suppose it's worth pointing, isn't, pointing out, isn't it, that this is, games are already having an impact. And I mean, I believe, maybe it sounds ridiculous, but I believe they could be the most powerful tool pharma have uh, for engaging with people you know, in, over the next decade, whether it be uh, healthcare professionals, whether it be patients, or whether it be working, you know, with, with clinical trials or even in drug discovery. But, you know, yeah. Maybe I'm maybe I'm way off, but I actually honestly believe that they could. You didn't say payers. So yeah. I had to pull you up on that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, I missed that out the checklist. <laughs> no, but yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. I, uh, I think the you know the two big the two you know there's a number of of, of uh, Stakeholders, I think that, that could be really useful to me. And, and I just, you know, speaking uh, as as, as Boeinger, mm. um in the US, we used a, a platform called uh, Kaggle, Kaggle, um, to to help our drug discovery mm. because you know molecules act in a certain way, and you can apply an algorithm to how mm. how they act, and you can apply different mathematical formulas to help you know um, predict how that uh, how molecules will, will will react with each other. And we put the algorithm that we used up onto Kaggle and, and asked crowdsource basically the community mm. there to say, can you come up with, uh, can you test the algorithm? Can you come up with something better? Mm. And um, so far, I think there's been about 300 people um, going on there, basically pulling it apart and come and they've come up with a better, um, a more efficient way of doing it than, than we had that we've been using for years and years and years. Yeah. And we put, you know, with the, all the resources that we have to put into that. They've done it, so um, it's been really fascinating, um, you know, uh, um, experience for us to to tap into that kind of uh, crowdsourced um, yeah it's, community. In fact, it's probably maybe it's good to, to go into that now because I think that this is something. This also has a crossover to me with social technology in its, in it, you know, its broader terms. In the sense that how often have people like yourself, I suppose I've been banging a drum for a long time about you know becoming a, a more social business which can sound I'll be on the less important end around whether people do a certain platform or you know this that and the other but more as a philosophy as a business about opening up and 
understanding that even if you have 100,000 people that work for your business, there's millions of people out there that can help you do things better. Yeah. It's simple you know, economics uh, or sociology or whichever one. Um, and from you know all of the books that we know about, like Wiganomics or like you know, Wisdom of the Crowd, or even like Anderson's Long Tail, um, we understand that you know we never can talk about Wikipedia. But what interests me in games is something you alluded to, which is if you look at something like Folder, where a problem of being able to create a three D model of a, a, a protein is in, in you know the, the monkey protease actually I think in 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 AIDS and HIV which has genuinely stumped scientists and computer models for one and a half decades. Um, fold it through a means of simple tools, and Washington University did, you know, created this fantastic game platform, basically. Allowed ordinary people, if you want to call people ordinary, which is probably not right, uh, to come on and just have a go at trying to solve these problems. And within three weeks, they had solved a problem that had stunned scientists. So what I think you well, pointed if, to is if, amazing, if, isn't it? What pharma could do if it opened up a tiny bit. Well, if you're if you're a, if you're a mathematician, you know, and you're fascinated by um, you know by, by numbers and equations and, and, and algorithms, the chances are you're probably going to some sort of technology type yeah. business. You, know, you yeah. work for Google or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You know, and 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 but those the brain power mm. that exists outside of, of healthcare. Um, if we can, if we can, like you said, become more social and apply that in, inside, then you know we, we can we can help solve all lots of problems that yeah. perhaps that we, we've been struggling to do, and it, it, it sends us to um, not to tap into that when when, yeah. when you have the technology now, which is the um, is kind of the enabler, you know, to allow you to do that. Maybe a lot of the things that you've been doing over the years um, have, are often portrayed as. as, as Landmark moments in themselves, in a sense of first people to do this or the first people to do that, or you know whatever it might be, and maybe people have missed the journey in a sense, in the sense that this isn't about whether your company or the company that I've worked for or whatever has Facebook or does Twitter, mm -hmm. but it's actually about something much more fundamentally powerful than that. But it's difficult to go from a company that can't accept at all the ability for the public to engage with them in a free and open yeah. way to then say, okay, and now tomorrow we're going to open up our clinical research yeah. and we're going to let people solve problems for us in science. There has to be a journey and maybe actually that journey that you've gone along is actually positioning the business in a way that people might not have seen five years ago or yeah. two years ago to be able to do exactly that. To well that's up. why it's such an exciting time because yeah. you, I think we're witnessing the um, awakening if you like of the farm industry to um, to social mm. to, and to digital and, and to all those tools and it's kind of it's it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it is. I, I completely agree. Um, but uh, yeah, and, it's, and we, we we might be behind other industries. Um, but if you look at you know the pharma industry, um, as a, is, is a massively innovative industry. Mm. You know, to drug discovery process itself mm. is hugely um, risky, mm. and it's hugely innovative, and, it, and it's you know cutting edge science. And we sometimes forget that that's the core of the mm. business. You know, so we are a truly innovative business, and it's just. You know that applying itself to some of the other ways that we open up and engage with people. No, I mean I, I think yeah, I'm sure we are behind different businesses depending on what their you know their objectives are and where they sit, what well, they what they do for a start. I mean, pharma obviously is in a particular regulated world doing things that it's done. You know, in a way, uh, you know the conservatism comes out of a necessity over the you know the history of the business. But yeah, no, I mean there's no doubt that if you, even if you look at Fold It again. You know what the one of the guys that helped set it up, Zoran Popovich, said in 2008 that he thought that an, an ordinary person, wanting to use that term again, could win the Nobel Prize for Chemistry or Medicine by using a, a, an open source gaming platform like theirs mm. to actually solve problems. Yeah, I mean the, the capacity once you open up a little bit and start to understand that people have uh, skills that you don't, and that you couldn't possibly have because you can only employ a certain amount of people. Uh, I think the times are really exciting, and if pharma gets it right. Um, it's ne it's not never about denigrating or putting down other people's industries because it's not the world isn't like that. But if pharma gets it right, it's not selling a soft drink or you know confectionery or clothes. It's improving people's lives, so saving people's lives. Absolutely. So you know, it, 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 at the end of the day, we still have that excitement of genuinely helping you know improve people's health. The health of the world is at stake. It is just as we say in syrup, which uh, you know is a 
I'm, I'm seeking to, <laughs> to the game that we yeah. developed on Facebook, where actually, you know, we've, we've put that uh, principle into gaming. So mm. we've said, well, what if, you know, we, you know, you have you have these game, these social games out there like you know, Farmville or mm. Castleville or whatever. Mm. whatever. Um, what if we can apply that to um, use the uh, pharmaceutical industry or, or the drug discovery? Mm -hmm. process as the, the kind of metaphor, the story, if you like, mm -hmm. on which we based the game. And, um, and let's, let's see if people find that engaging and, and want to play a game where they get to, you know, the mission is, you talked about missions, the mission is to cure, cure the disease, mm -hmm. one disease at a time. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something, last night was the first time um, I got to play the game yeah. um, in its entirety. Um, so we'll be launching that. In, in and how did you do it? Did you, uh, yeah, well, solve any problems? It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was fun. So uh, yeah, I got to uh, discover some molecules and, okay. uh, and stabilize them, and then uh, yeah, and then I could put them through to this clinical trial, which is like a card trading mm -hmm. game where I fought the disease. You know, it's a social game. So playing on your own is one element of it. Yeah, of it's when you get you know uh, millions of people playing mm -hmm. together, which hopefully. Yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it well, will. 96 million people play Farmville, they so, do. Um, and they're not all interested in farming. So uh, I suspect very few. Uh, and uh, you know, it's interesting you say that about the farming side because why couldn't it give people even a, a slightly better understanding, if nothing more, it may be more than that, but a slightly better understanding of the complex process of discovering, yeah. you know, in, in a medicine, and actually how hard it is to bring that to market. I mean. Farmville isn't going to teach people about complex agrarian economies, but in yeah. the end, it's not trying to, is it? But you know, the, the, the capacity to integrate what people like to do socially and social gaming platforms with something a little bit of a higher motive. I'm trying yeah. to explain a little bit more. About well, I think what we've done is we've created, or what we've done is created a game. Um, Serum's a game in itself, and it's a fun game. Mm. And the spin-offs from that, the educational pieces. So you don't even have to do those spin-offs if you don't want to. You know, you can mm -hmm. press stop on the video, which tells you, well done, you've completed your first clinical trial. This is why we do clinical trials. Yeah. I'm not interested. Skip. You know, the next bit. Yeah. But then if we, we can build in, you know, certain feedback mechanisms. So you know, you can get plus ten on your clinical trial if if you watch this video. Mm -hmm. Great. You know, in Farmville, people would pay fifty p for a tractor or a pink sheep. Yeah. You know, in our game, you know, you, you don't have to pay any money, but mm -hmm. perhaps if you fill out, you know, a questionnaire or what look at video then you get yeah. bonuses on so the pace is you know the system is it's just yeah, something exactly should... and and it's and the release is the is just the first iteration of the game so it's not a launch and that's it mm. when you're talking before about crowdsourcing mm. well this is very much going to be about feedback loops mm. so the first release of the game will go out to a beta tested small you know community mm. we'll get that feedback and then we'll try and incorporate it back in the game and as we go through different releases of the game mm. um, including in you know with the general public player as well then it will all be about those iterative sort of feedback loops, which is something, another sort of principle, if you like, that in pharma perhaps we don't necessarily do all the time. You know, we tend to get a product that is finished and then, you know, it has to be perfect, mm. obviously, because it's a medicine mm. and we launch it. Whereas um, we're trying to cite different, different principles on this one. Yeah, and of course, perfection is impossible, yeah. um, even for me. Which, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, glad you recognise. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I try, try to, uh, but no, I eat it completely. And uh, understanding that things are iterative, and at the end of the day, um, you know, it's it's a perpetual project in digital, full stop. But particularly in producing something as complex as a social game. Yeah. And thinking about that, I mean, obviously, social gaming is is different to other types of, you know, immersive virtual games. Uh, of which uh, I'm sure you play World of Warcraft. Yeah, yourself, I've, I've, yeah, 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 yeah I've played I don't, and obviously I only tried it out for professional purposes, yes. but uh, a lot of people do. Uh, I didn't get past the first day. <laughs> it's, it's, it's probably not for me, but it is a fascinating thing, and it leads me on to the question I want to ask about Serum, which is that in World of Warcraft, there's about, well, there's over 10 million people that are subscribed. You basically are a good or a bad person, an orc or a, you know, a human or a dwarf. Uh, and you run missions and fight baddies and interact with each other, uh, so I'm told. Uh, and you know, you can. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> something happened uh, like 2005 where you, you know a, a disease, the blood plague. You know, uh, it's it spread throughout the, the the game from a particular part of the game it shouldn't have done. People have used it to, to try and map the spread of infectious disease or pandemics in a way that they found difficult in the real world because people behave so bizarrely in times of stress and chaos. Um, and so I suppose it's that part as a understanding of the way people behave in these kind of environments. And what the stat that fascinated me, but I do love stats, is that 
the amount of time people have spent playing World of Warcraft it equates almost exactly to the amount of time we've evolved as a species, it's five point something billion years. So it's an amazing amount of hours that people have actually spent. Uh, I know many millions of people play Farmville, but would, could there be something in that as well, as to understand once you get real people interacting uh, through a platform like this, is there some way that maybe we can understand behaviours or the way people behave within even something like drug discovery or interacting with pharmaceuticals more broadly, pharmaceutical companies more broadly? I mean, perhaps. It's not, um, it's not something we've considered with, with serum um, yet. But as I said, it's an iterative of course. process. So um, that could be something that gets built in, in, in the future. Mm. Um, or not. Uh, no, I mean, to me, I mean, the fact that you actually you know, that you're doing this will, will be interesting as well to see how people do react to a, a game that is social and on a very, so obviously, a social platform that's yeah. integrated into people's lives as to how they think about interacting well, Facebook, with game fronts. Farmer. Facebook is the social platform, right? I think it was mm. Seth from Scavenger who talked about that and he said, you know, there's, there's no challenge that can't be solved through gaming. Mm. Um, and um, I'm, I'm not saying that Serum's going to kind of be, you know, solving any huge fundamental sort of problems that we have, but um, if it can, you know, in some way give some insights either through the way that human people behave, humans behave, or, or even if it's just to in some way promote healthy behaviours or educate people in, in a way which is fun and engaging at the same time, then, then it's, it's, been a, it's been a success. But even if it isn't a success, the journey upon which we're on, um, you know, and, I, and, I, and I use success in kind of quite loose, loose terms, um, then we'll, we'll have learned from that as well. So and I think it was um, um, a guy from IBM Tom, Thomas Watson said, you know, if you want to be truly innovative, double the amount of failure you have. Mm. Um, because if you're not failing, then you're not pushing the envelope, you know, you're mm. not stretching yourself. So I think with Serum, really stretched on this, you know, really stretched our thinking and, um, and the, way, the way that we've approached it mm. uh, has been quite sort of um, risky. Mm. So um, it's been a fascinating journey in itself anyway. Mm. Wow, well, completely. And I suppose. To sum it up, then I mean we've spoken about you know games themselves driving kind of interface with technology, and I suppose in, in trying to integrate some of the principles of games into uh, other applications that you know then into things like crowdsourcing, clinical trials, you know understanding how we can harness gamers for science. Mm. I suppose finishing then on what must be the first social game that a pharmaceutical companies ever produce. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, I think so. yeah. And, and, and even some of the technology we've used, so um, you know, once you've got your drug developed in the game, um, you have check-ins. Mm. Uh, so you, you have, um, uh, when you check in on your phone using Facebook Places, that, that, comes, that interacts with the game, mm. and you get different points for, where, for how many check-ins you have, mm. and then you can decide whether or not you want to use those check-ins to sell your drug and get more money, yeah. or you can use it for humanitarian reasons. Mm. And if you do humanitarian missions with your check-ins, then you unlock certain um, un, you know, locked um, elements of the game. Mm. So we kind of, you know, stretching the use of technology, because to my mind, I don't know of any other game that uses Facebook places or check-ins in mm. the gaming system. So not just for pharma, for games itself, mm. there's, there's some cutting edge elements to it and some uncharted territory there. Well, well I look forward to the uh, beta invite, John, definitely, and wish you... Uh, Serum-game.com. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I hope I'm not blocked. But uh, <laughs> thanks so much for speaking. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thanks very much.